Yes. May I now request Professor Patnaik to deliver her talk, please. Um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. In what way is such an analysis relevant for an understanding of today's developments? Do we see today a process of economic recolonization going on, despite political uh, autonomy? And where do questions of land reforms and egalitarian values of social progress fit into all these issues? First of all, let's ask ourselves the question, which is very basic, to which I have been trying to develop an answer for many decades. Why did a handful of maritime European countries, Spain, Portugal, uh, Netherlands, France, Britain, being the main countries, at all seek to conquer and politically subjugate what are today's developing countries? What made these people travel halfway around the world? What was the driving force behind such external expansionism? After all, we don't find Chinese or Indians you know, trying to conquer other people. Other than Ireland under Britain and Korea under Japan, all conquered and colonially subjugated populations and territories which lasted up to the 20th century were in tropical areas. The major reason, I believe, was from the beginning the very low living standard of European populations. As long as they relied on their own limited productive capacity, particularly their very limited agricultural productivity. So Van Bart points out that the medieval chronicles record collective cannibalism in such situations. They were rare, of course. And by collective cannibalism, I mean, uh, you know, uh, something which distinguishes it from the kind of, uh, you know, individual cannibalism like the Nithari murders and so on, which is basically to do with an individual's uh, you know, abnormal state. But this was uh, an, an entire communities which had no food. And therefore the people who died, I mean, they, as the author puts it, uh, the population which survived did not hesitate to appease their hunger in strange fashions. And he's referring to these chronicles. Now these facts are not generally known to us in developing countries because we are continuously told that um, you know, your productivity is very low compared to that of Europe and so on. And uh, the history of low productivity is not uh, ever uh, uh, known to us. And of course, many of these factors of low productivity have been overcome in today's technologically advanced agriculture under capitalism. Following has been greatly reduced. Sea deal ratios have also been reduced very greatly and yields raised. Uh, and there is a, now a few very large surplus of food trains. But one thing that no amount of technological change under capitalism can alter, and that is the climate. That is, single cropping is something that the most advanced, industrially advanced societies have not been able to do anything about. So as long as there is single cropping and they grow only one crop a year, there is a, still a very great asymmetry between agricultural production in the north and agricultural production in the global south. Our warmer lands not only produce a much larger range of crops all the year round, but it produces, they produce qualitatively different output vectors compared to coal lands. Especially the larger countries like China and India can not only produce every temperate land crop, fruit and vegetable in our winter season, which they produce in their summer. In addition, we produce the typically tropical crops, which the advanced countries cannot produce at all under any circumstances, and for which they have always been import dependent and remain import dependent to this day. In fact, the degree of import dependence is not reducing compared to the colonial period. It is actually increasing as rich populations demand more diversified consumption baskets and as the cost of uh, transportation of products from third world lands, warmer lands, to the north have reduced drastically and you have much cheaper air freighting now. The range of products they have demanded, they demand now has extended from the non-perishable products of the 19th and early 20th century. The typical, you know, tropical crops that we all know about. It has extended now to a range of very highly perishable 
uh, goods from our agriculture, fresh fruit, vegetables, seafood, etc., can now be air, air freighted in a matter of 15 hours or so to the other side of the globe and is being air freighted with the entry of the giant transnational companies which are seeking to access our lands. So, uh, I mentioned that these facts are very obvious when they're stated, but our own intellectuals do not understand the priceless nature of our own land endowments. You will find nothing of this in the literature because our literature is derivative, our academic work is derivative from the academic work in northern universities. And whether deliberately or unconsciously or whatever it is, I'm not imputing motives, but the whole of northern theory dealing with agriculture and trade, it seems to me is designed to obfuscate material reality, including the Ricardian theory of trade, which is based on the assumption that all countries produce all goods, which is precisely the opposite of material reality that in fact northern countries in agriculture cannot produce a very large range of goods. Mind you, their populations are now habituated to consuming these goods. The living standards of northern populations, if trade ceased with warmer lands, would certainly not plunge down back to medieval levels because now they have no problem of grain shortage. In fact, they have a surplus of grains, but it would certainly become extremely uh, monotonous, the food basket would become very restricted, even the number, uh, the kind of fibers that are used for clothing would drastically be reduced to the same wool and linen which was in use in medieval times because, you know, the demand for cotton simply cannot be met by their own lands. Now this is very important to remember, what I've been talking about, I think, because this asymmetry, as I mentioned, persists in present times. There can be reciprocity in trade in non-agricultural goods. We can export our manufacturers to northern countries and import their manufacturers. But there is and can be no reciprocity in trade in agricultural products. It is largely a one-way demand, where today's advanced countries want us to use more and more of our land to produce a vast range of products which they cannot ever produce, which they can never import substitute but which they covet and which they now take for granted, which underpin their highly diversified consumption patterns. And in turn, they would like us to depend on them for the grains which they can produce in abundance and for, of which they have a glut. Now, obviously, the consumption basket and living standards of medieval populations started to improve only after their external expansion, their colonial conquest and subjugation of other societies. With political control and the colonial systems, it was easy for northern countries, the main colonizing countries, Britain, France, and so on. Netherlands colonized Java, Britain had the largest empire, of course, mainly in Asia, but also in the Caribbean. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, Portugal and Spain were the earliest colonizers with vast empires in Latin America and later Philippines. It was easy with colonial conquest, not only to get the goods they wanted, but moreover to get them without paying for them, without paying anything at all, they get them free. All they had to do was to establish property rights. That is, take over land from indigenous populations and enslave them, or when they were massacred to a point of extinction, import uh, enslaved populations from West Af Africa to run slave-run plantations, slave-based plantations producing tropical crops for export, as in the Caribbean, or as an island, take over land from the indigenous producers, reduce them to pauperize tenants and extract rent rents, as the Anglo-Irish landlords did. But in India, countries like India and so on, which were already densely populated, the method was not enslavement, it could not be. Uh, the method was mainly the imposition of uh, rents and taxes, and taxes by the state and uh, the consolidation of the property rights of local landholders who were taxed and who in turn were permitted to rack rent their tenants at will. The surplus product was directly taken as slave rent or land rent, or in the case of India, the taxes raised from the peasants and artisans were used to buy the peasants' crops and the artisans' textiles, thus getting the goods completely free as the commodity equivalent of tax. 
When we look at the history of our own freedom struggle, I would argue that while there was a broad understanding of colonial exploitation, especially after the work of Dadabhai Naruhi and Ramesh Chandra Dutt on the famous drain of wealth, nevertheless there was no clear analytical understanding on the part of Indian public intellectuals and political leaders, including on the part of Nehru and Gandhi, of the actual mechanisms of colonial exploitation and especially the exploitation of the peasantry. And I say this because incorrect measures like rupee depreciation was supported ardently by even nationalist public intellectuals, which made the position of the peasantry even worse. What is more shocking to me is that to this day, we still have no correct analysis of the mechanism of exploitation, which contributed to build the empire, to diffuse capitalism from Britain and Europe to regions of recent white settlement uh, via the huge capital exports that Britain and France undertook in North America, in Latin America, in Australia, South Africa, and so on. All this was dependent on colonial exploitation. It made the pound sterling, the universal reserve currency, considered to be as good as gold. So first, a few words about this mechanism. First of all, the sheer scale of colonial exploitation is still very little appreciated in my view. When the permanent settlement of revenues in Bengal was carried out in 1793, the total revenue collected from the zamindars was actually slightly more than the sum the British government raised from their own landlords, from the whole of Britain. Then, of course, the revenues were made to increase very fast as conquest was extended to North India, to the Bombay Deccan, to Madras Presidency, and finally with the conquest of Punjab in, uh, when was Punjab? 1848, uh, and then Burma was annexed after three Burmese wars, a very rich uh, surplus producing area. About one third of the net tax collection was used for purchasing and shipping out export goods, manufactured textiles, rice, indigo, jute, opium, and later tea and tea. All this was completely free for Britain because it was simply the transformation of taxes from the form of money to the form of goods. Without this transfer combined with slave rents from the Caribbean, the Industrial Revolution could not have taken place at the time and in the form that it did. Now, I don't want to take a lot of time discussing this. I have a long paper called The Free Lunch, in which following uh, Saira Habib's method, I estimated the contribution of colonial transfer from Asia and the West Indies to capital formation in Britain to have been of such an order as to double the rate of capital formation out of domestic sales and to give that, uh, that initial big push which allowed Britain to make the transition to, a, to the factory sector at a very unlikely time when it was embroiled in the financial strains of the Napoleonic Wars. Yet when we look at recent modern discussion of the drain of wealth, which was first initiated more than 100 years ago by Naraji and that, we find no connection drawn between collection of taxes and the drain of wealth. There is no conceptual understanding at all and making strong statements. And particularly this is so in works like the Cambridge Economic History of India. There, is only, there are only two exceptions to this. The writings of Professor Irfan Habib and Saira Habib. The most basic and elementary concept still does not seem to be understood. That if I am the colonial government, I tax you and use your own money to buy the goods you have produced, it is not a normal market transaction. I'm not actually paying you for your goods, but simply changing the form of my tax demand on you from cash to export products. Part of these exports were paid for, in brackets, in, uh, in quotation marks, by imports, which themselves were not necessarily desired by the people, but were thrust on them by protecting British markets for 150 years, while keeping the colonial market open, producing deindustrialization. And when I, as the colonial government, exported these free products to my own country, Britain, in excess of any imports from that country, they were free because Britain did not need to pay the colony anything for the exports. And when I exported the products to third countries in Europe and America, Britain got to keep all the gold in foreign exchange that producers in India had earned. In fact, peasants and artisans themselves did not realize 
that they were being ripped off. When the Bengal artisan or peasant sold cloth or jute to the company's agent, it appeared to him no different from selling to the local Marwari trader. In fact, if the person taking tax from him and the person who bought his jute uh, cloth had been the same person, then of course it would have raised a doubt in his mind. He would have said, Dal me kuch to kala hai. How can you take my money and then use that money to take my product? Uh, this is not a normal transaction. But of course that did not happen. The simple mechanism of market exchange was quite baffling. The person who took the tax was different from the person who bought the product, though the purchase price of the product came out of the tax. So the fact that uh, there was a trickery involved did not strike the producers themselves. Gandhi was born exactly 20 years before Nehru in October 1869, while Nehru was born in November 1889. The period when Gandhi was a young man in the process of initiating himself into public life up to the First World War was the period of high imperialism and the beginning of the international gold standard whose full flowering coincided with Nehru's youth and entry into public life after the First World War. Britain's role as the world capitalist leader depended crucially on the sharply increased drain of wealth from India and other tropical colonies which lubricated the working of the gold standard, ensured the diffusion of capitalist development to the regions of white settlement. This was the period of the maximum extraction of surplus from India and other colonies, which reduced their producers to an abject state of poverty and uh, where the population in general experienced falling nutritional standards. Though mind you, this kind of colonial rule could not uh, exist without domestic collaborators, and the class of domestic hangers-on and collaborators, of course, improved their living standards enormously at the expense of the rest of the population. The widely held misconception that uh, productivity is very high, land productivity is high in North America. I've taken only three countries here, China, India, and the USA. It was never higher in Europe or USA compared to tropical countries or compared to China. The reason that people say it was higher is because they use a long, wrong definition of productivity. What they do is compare what the European farmer, and this is something Arthur Lewis does, surprisingly, he commits this fallacy of composition where he compares what the uh, uh, British farmer produced, the yield the British farmer produced, and he produced it over the entire agricultural year, he grew only one crop, with the yield that the Indian farmer produced, but this was the crop that the Indian farmer produced over four months. And it was not the only crop he produced. He produced, in addition, a second crop, either of a food grain or cotton, and sometimes even a third crop of a gram or a pulse. So in order to compare, you have to keep the period the same, the period of production the same. So Lewis's comparison was not valid. And if you take a given agricultural period like a year, and then you compare, uh, this relates to a uh, more recent period, 2007, to this day, despite all the technological advance that uh, northern countries have made, and the USA has, is more technologically advanced than any other, you can see that the, the physical output in tons per hectare in China is 11.7 tons compared to USA's 3.8 and India's 5.2. Even India has higher productivity per hectare than China does on a correct definition of productivity. So unless we know this, if you're constantly thinking that agriculture is very, has very low productivity, we will not simply understand what the motivation of, what one of the most important motivations of colonization was. That, is the pri that was the primary motivation which ruled from uh, 1600 when the East India Company was formed right up to the 1830s. That is for 230 years. The primary motivation was not acquiring markets. It was acquiring resources which these countries lacked. After that, of course, the use of the colonies as markets for industrial manufacturing products, very well known, became very important. But the share of agricultural products in total British imports still remained higher than the share of raw materials throughout, because these countries were food deficient. So uh, the method followed was, of course, to encourage export and to encourage export surplus in particular from India. So this gives you a long-term trend 
of uh, India's trade surplus. It's not the exports, it's not the imports, it's export minus imports. So despite all the uh, textiles that Britain poured into the Indian market, which led to deindustrialization, India still had an overall export surplus because it had export surplus vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. By the last two decades of the 19th century and up to 1928, that is for nearly 50 years, India had the second largest export surplus earnings in the entire world, second only to the USA. There are United Nations data. Uh, there's a very famous report by Fork Hilgert, which came out. This was actually not UN, but League of Nations in 1942, which gives you the matrix of global trade, where we can find out exactly what countries our exports went to and what imports we got from what countries. So this kind of matrix is quite difficult to build up. So we don't have it for every year. We only have it for selected years. And then more recently, the UN has put online, uh, I haven't got a hard copy, uh, they have put online the same exercise which they've done right up to 1960. After that, I'm not aware that the exercise has been done again. So this is a very valuable source of data which I have used. These UN data permit us to calculate the amounts of export surplus earnings very precisely. But not a single pound sterling of these earnings was permitted to flow back to India. The monetary gold and exchange earnings flowed into the account held in the Bank of England by the Secretary of State for India in London. While the Indian exporters of the goods which earned these vast sums were sent to bills of exchange, some of you know the term for these bills of exchange, council bills, which could be encashed only in rupees, where the rupees in turn came out of the budget revenues earmarked for that purpose, revenues which the producers themselves had been made to contribute as taxes. The payment for that, that foreigners made in terms of gold and foreign exchange, was intercepted in London. It was not permitted to come back to the country, to our country, to the producers who had actually earned it. Instead, what the importers were allowed to send were bills of exchange, which were rupee bills. They could only be cashed in rupees in India. But those rupees in turn were not additional rupees over and above the budget amount. They were rupees which came out of uh, the certain portion of the budget, which was earmarked for this purpose. So in effect, the colonial government ran a surplus budget. The taxes they collected were not spent entirely under the normal heads you have in a sovereign country. A very large portion was spent simply to recompense the export producers, but it was the export producers themselves who had contributed those taxes. So the same system as before continued, but in a slightly more uh, complicated form. It's not very complicated, but I don't know why this system seems to be so difficult to understand on the part of our economists and historians. A big cut was taken by the export houses and the dalals, and the peasants only got a pittance as payment. By 1913, the export surplus earnings were about around 35 million pounds, and they had risen, risen to uh, more than 50 million pounds by 1928. Very large sums for that time. The export surplus varied between 45 to 65 percent of import values, it would have been even larger if compulsory imports from Britain had been absent. That is, if India had not been, had been allowed to protect itself against manufacturers from Britain, then of course its export surplus would have been much larger. During the First World War, towards the end of the war, there was a big export surge from India. Very large extra sums, around 100 million pounds were earned over and above the normal export surplus. Now, if you look at the budget data, you find that 100 million pounds was transferred as a gift from British India to Britain. The British made monkeys out of our intellectuals who made estimates of India's balance of payments without a single cons reference to the drain because they simply had no conceptual understanding at all of what was going on. I'm using strong words, but I do think that it's a shame that 100 years after Naoji and Dutt pointed the way, we still do not have people who are working on the historical data to actually find out what the extent of this exploitation was. All this meant a tremendous squeeze on the incomes of the peasants, that is income deflation, which was necessary because you had to restrict the consumption of the domestic population through high taxation in order to force them to produce 
commercial goods and particularly export goods. From one-sixth of the budget going to home charges, the fraction rose to 27% by the late 1920s. But home charges were only a small part of export earnings. For example, uh, in 1910, home charges, I'm just giving you snapshot pictures, home charges were 22 million compared to the credit claimed by Britain of 60 million pounds. Thank you very much.